Hi, Julie. Uh, thanks for joining me on the uh, podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yes, uh, you've, uh, as I was mentioning, just as we were chit-chatting a little just before we came on there, this is a topic that I'm actually very enthusiastic about because I happen to be a non-clutterer, but I'm very interested in uh, so to speak, how the other half lives, if I might put it that way. <laughs> hey, that's, you know, a lot of times, especially in households, you have someone that tends to be more organized and clutter free and someone that's not. So it's, I think, a really important topic. Yeah, no, it's I'm a very interested. And you've written a whole series of books now on the topic. Uh, you you started off, with, as far as I could tell, uh, I read part of the original book. You also have a workbook. And then you then you had a book, at least one book of sort of tips, cluttering tips as well. And I think you have calendars and rem and things like that as well, right? Whole kind of product line, as it were. I do. So I have books that are based on my podcast, Clear Your Clutter Inside and Out. And then I created a whole journal prompt series because we all have the answers within. But how I did it is kind of explain this is how to answer. And, and then another step that I added is after you've answered the question, take out what's most important from that. And then I explain, here's how you can reach your goals and move forward and set up an action plan. Because it's great once we have the information, but awareness plus action equals change. We have to have both those parts to change our lives. It, it, no, and I wanted to actually, I had some comments about that. That's very well put. The first thing I want to ask you, though, is do you hear back from readers or uh, uh, listeners to your podcast uh, that you're helping them make a dent in their belongings and, and, th yes. and things like that. And, and it makes me the most happiest when I hear that, that I've helped change lives. It just, that's what it's about. We all have gifts to share. And so I view my role as supporting people because when they clear the clutter, they can focus on what matters most. The other thing, and I, I have some more, this is just, this is kind of a devil's advocate question in a, kind of, in a sort of way. Do you think there are cases where, you know, clutter is just fine, you know, where someone says, as long as I can find my car keys and I know where the fridge is, uh, I'm good to go? Or is there some, or is that not the case? Is clutter inherently in its nature uh, something that is a bad thing for someone? That's a great question. I've never been asked that. So what I would say, it depends on what amount of clutter works for you. Do you know what I, I mean? My house isn't perfect. I'm not Martha Stewart and I don't strive to be that way. So I think if you can find what you need when you need it, do you feel peaceful when you walk into your home? Is it causing conflict with you if you live with other people? Those are the kind of questions that I would say, ask yourself, and then you can determine what is it a problem or isn't it? And, you know, I broaden my definition of clutter. So we all have clutter because for me, clutter is in the inner and the outer world. So you can have spiritual, emotional, relationship, health clutter, you know, everything potentially can be clutter. So I don't want people to just look at the physical stuff. Does that make sense? Yes. And I, 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 I saw that from your book and I wanted to ask you more about the physical and the spiritual and those sorts of things. Yes. I hear what you're saying. Uh, technically then uh, the answer to the question that I asked is, there might be cases, you could imagine cases where if someone has clutter and maybe a lot of it, but it's not interfering with their lives or their their uh, relationships or anything, theoretically, that might be fine. <laughs> yeah, I would say theoretically, but the but it's, we, if we talk about awareness, like, are you really aware? Is it true that you don't have clutter? Is it, you know what, I don't want to deal with this, so I'm just not going to pretend that it's there. So I think that's important to to take into account as well. That's actually an extremely good point, right? Someone could easily come to the conclusion that, oh, there's no, there's no problem. Mm -hmm, no, as people yeah. do in the, with their emotions often as well. Um, I, as I mentioned to you briefly when we were chatting before, uh, just before we came on, I'm a minimalist myself. So, uh, and th so this is a topic I truly do find really fascinating. I was a big fan of those hoarder programs. Mm -hmm. I just, I, you know, just sort of uh, uh, seeing that. And for me, there's there's at least three reasons why people hold on to things when if you look at it, I don't know, scientifically, so to speak, uh, there's no reason to. One is that, and this my mother falls into this category, there might be some use for it in the future. So, you know, she's, she's a, like a, the, you know, the grand generation before the boomers, 
uh, that saved everything, you know, yeah. that that kind of thing. So it might come in useful. These tea towels that I have may be useful 20 years from now. Another one is a uh, sentimental value. And mm -hmm. maybe people, I even have, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty strict with my minimalism, but I even have things that if they didn't have sentimental value, I would have them, I would have, I would toss them away. And the other thing is that there's a kind of an obligation one as well, I think, where someone will keep, uh, because their, um, you know, their, their, their uncle gave them this gift of something, they feel obliged to keep it for some reason. It, it suddenly gains a category that it wouldn't have had, and they may hate the, this vase or whatever it might be. So those are the three, at least three categories. Are there, can you think of other categories or do those strike you as, as being, um, as, as making sense? I think they all make sense. And I'd like to touch on each one if you're open to that. Yes, so please. first, the first one, what I would say to that is, uh, so, you know, I might need it someday, right? And someday tends not to come. And so what I would say to that, can you trust what you need that you will get what you need when you need it? And that's a big deal for people because sometimes, you know, you talk about your mom's generation. I completely get that. You know, you, you, if you've gone through poverty, if you've gone through war, you get that you don't waste, not right, waste, not want, not. But, but I, what I would say is there are solutions. So you could maybe barter with someone if you gave it away. You could rent it. You could uh, see if it's in a buy nothing group. I want people to kind of start to think like, you know, if I give that item away and I do need it three years from down the road, that I will be able to, to do something about that. The second one of sentimental reasons, the thing that we do is that we will place our emotions and memories on an object, but our memories and ob and aren't on that object. They're in our hearts and they're in our heads. Like an example for me would be my grandma. I got my great grandmother when she died. They said, here, have her furniture that she used as a kid, which is great. It was our guest bedroom furniture. They also gave me a set of dishes, which knowing my grandmother, she got for free in 1950, opening up a bank account. And by the time they got to me, they were gray. They were white eventually. Right. And it, and then I was like, oh, I can't let those go. And then I went and heard Peter Wall speak. And I was like, my grandmother's not in those dishes and I don't need them. And someone else can get better use. So remember, our memories aren't in the objects, heart and head. And then finally, with obligation, I think this is so true. And, you know, my mother unfortunately died last year. And one thing that I always said prior to her death and that I, I believe wholeheartedly after she passed was when people die, they don't want us to feel burdened or guilt with their possessions if we don't want them. Because I see a lot of people stuck, especially if someone's passed, like, oh, I don't want to get rid of it because uncle so-and-so gave it to me. And so I would say people want you to be free. They want you to be happy. And what I do is when I give a gift, because maybe that uncle is still alive, is I, I tried really hard to get something that you would like. And that's why I try tend to give gifts that are useful, not something that would collect us and say, I tried my best. If you don't like it, then please pass it along. Mm. You know, charities always have auctions these days, brand yeah. new items. You know, there are lots of good things that you can do with something that you don't want. And the truth of the matter is how likely is someone going to come into your home? I say this a lot with wedding gifts and say, oh, 20 years ago, I gave you that crystal vase. <laughs> and where is it? Likelihood yeah. is, is, is minimal. So I just wanted right. to share those thoughts on those three points. That th those are very good points. It's funny because I was uh, I just happened to visit my family uh, a couple of weeks ago for the first day since COVID, and my mother was there as well. And we were having this discussion about, uh, uh, frankly, it was about uh, some silverware, and uh, she was talking about uh, giving it away, and she was a little puzzled as to why, say, uh, you know, so let's say a, a, a niece. Or a, or a sister-in-law might not appreciate it. And I, I was trying to tell her that, for example, in my place here, I've got lots of things that are valuable to me, but once I'm dead, um, you know, other people see it in a different way. It just looks like a thing that has no, and I, I don't want to, I don't want people to feel, well, they have to dispose of it in a proper way or make sure this, uh, you know, there might be a couple of things where I'll say, this has to go here, but for mm -hmm. the rest of it, uh, throw it out, give it away, whatever you want. It's valuable to me. Other people see it as just either junk or an object. That's all. Yeah. And a lot of the younger generations are living a lot more lightly and they don't want the stuff. Yeah, that's right. Yes. In a 550, 
square foot apartment, uh, you probably don't want a, a, a gigantic table from, from yes. your great grandmother. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. The other thing, uh, just getting beyond the physical part, because I found this very interesting, and I believe this was your first book. Uh, you go beyond the discussion of talking about physical disadvantages. For example, if you have a 550 square foot apartment and you have giant furniture in there, there's an obvious physical disadvantage there because you have to, you know, kind of, you know, squeeze yourself to get out to the kitchen. But you talk about emotional, mental, and spiritual effects as well. And I wonder if, if you could, for listeners, just uh, just touch on each of those a little bit. Sure. So mental clutter for me can be monkey mind. It's insomnia. If you're being kept up at night, it's worrying, it's anxiety. And, you know, just one example that probably people can relate to, if you have mental clutter, clearing your desk, clear, and that's how I talk about how the physical or the inner and the reflects the outer and vice versa. So if you clear your desk, you're going to help clear your mind. So that's something that's why I was like, at the end of the week, if you don't do it, at the end of the day, clear your desk to help clear your mental clutter. But, you know, if you're having anxiety, one thing that you can do is a lot of times when we worry or anxious, become present, right? We can't change the past. I've tried really hard and I can't change the past and I can't control the future. Some things are within my control, mm -hmm. but not everything. But when we are present, we have the, that is our point of power to change. So if ever you feel yourself starting to get mentally overwhelmed, stop, take a deep breath and become present as much as possible and say, okay, what do I need to do right now? What do I, what can I do in the present moment? So like, for example, if you're like, oh my gosh, I I'm worried about retirement. I haven't been saving. Don't spend your time worrying, become present say, okay, I'm going to ask Sue who knows a lot about money. I'm going to talk to HR on Monday about our retirement plan at work. I'm going to stop. I'm going to go from Starbucks five days a week to one day a week. So in that present moment, you can create a plan that helps alleviate your anxiety. Right. And, uh, uh, the the spiritual effects as well like uh do you, do you sort of uh, lump those all together in the same sort of thing you have the spiritual the the physical on one end and then the mental spiritual emotional the sort of the other i see them all separate really now someone might disagree and i might say for example forgiveness to me is if you're unable to forgive or you don't if unable to have gratitude then that to me is spiritual clutter someone else might say oh well Maybe I'd consider that emotional clutter. For me, emotional clutter is being angry all the time when you're jealous, when you have those knee-jerk reactions instead of getting centered and taking a moment and taking a deep breath. And because a lot of those time, those knee-jerk reactions are from the past. Again, how do we get present? If we were hurt 10 years ago, it doesn't mean that this situation means that we're automatically going to get hurt again. So I see them as different categories, but they all, in my opinion, overlap and affect one another. So as you clear your spiritual clutter and are able to have more gratitude, I believe that helps your emotional clutter because you can't be jealous and have gratitude at the same time. You can't mm -hmm. hold those two opposing thoughts. So as you are able to have more gratitude, then the likelihood of you lessening being jealous will increase. Right. I want, I want to ask you a couple more questions, but I did want to bring this up because I noticed there's some really, um, I thought, very uh, short, but very um, um, important uh, messages and a couple of epigraphs to some of your chapters. And one that really struck me was uh, what you collect reflects what you feel is missing from your life. I wonder if you could just say a little bit about that. That the uh, I'm not I'm not quite sure I know what it means, but I think I know what it means. Okay, well that's a great question. That's one of the things that I'm truly uh, believe is important with your physical cl cl uh, clutter. So I'll use myself as an example. So when I was living in Los Angeles, I was a victim of a violent crime, and after that happened, the first thing I did was I found an angel and I put an angel over my door. So for me, angels represent love and protection. Now, I, I wasn't consciously aware of this, but mm -hmm. and then after that, I started to collect angels. And what I was doing was trying to love myself with physical items and protect myself. And then I was reading a book on feng shui one day, and it talks about that. It said, what you collect, you know, what is it that you feel like you're missing from your life? So I felt I was missing love and protection. So I wanted to surround myself 
with physical items. And so if you collect a lot of things, and that's where I encourage you, dig a little deeper, ask yourself some question. What need is it you're trying to fulfill? What do you think's missing from life? Does that make it a little more clear? Yeah, I see what you mean. The angel's example is a good one. And I, I think I've seen, a, um, a mention to you, I was, uh, I think I've been watched over and over again, those hoarding shows, and that that issue would come up a lot. And speaking of that, that's actually was my final question. I wanted to ask, when does, I mean, cluttering is bad enough, if I can put it that way, as a thing in itself, but when does it start, or why does it start, or with whom does it start to cross over and become an outright psychological problem like hoarding? Well, there are definitely, I'm not trained to work with hoarders. So there are people that have special training on that. I would say, you know, I'll share this example. When I was first starting my business, someone heard me speak and then they hired me and I walked into the house and I'm very like, this is what I'm about. Like, I'm not someone who's going to do, say, oh, I can help you when I can't because that doesn't do either of us good. So I walked in the house and the first thing out of her mouth was, I don't know if it's a national hoarding site or whatever, there was a hoarding site. And she said, it says you're a hoarder. If you have from the wall, 16 inches of clutter. And I only have 15 inches out from the wall. Now <laughs> in my definition, this was a hoarder. And so, uh, you know, I think that obviously there's a psychological issue going on. You know, in my personal belief, everything happens in childhood, although you could have a trauma as an adult and one response would be to hoard things. So that's yep. when, you know, you definitely have a mental illness going on. It's super important if you have a loved one that's hoarding that you work with someone who is trained to handle that. I'm not. So if I ever get anyone like that, I have someone that I can refer to. But I think that that's really important. One of the worst things that you can do is start throwing things out or taking them away because that's, I don't want to say taking a, a blanket away. That's the best analogy I can come up with in the moment, but there's a security. There's a mental reason around that. So you want to make sure, be very careful with that. I would say the majority of us have clutter. I would yeah. say I know more people with clutter than I don't know, very few minimalists and you are now one of them. So, <laughs> there, you know, there, there aren't as many minimalists. Like there's definitely a movement towards that. But I think I really want people to take away to see the bigger picture that the clutter is more than just the physical stuff. So a messy desk can be a roadblock to getting a promotion. A stuffed closet can prevent a relationship from blooming. I want them to see really and truly how clutter affects their life. And maybe I'll just end on a sort of a practical note. Uh, it struck me uh, from what I was reading that uh, decluttering is maybe generally something that people need help with I mean, people need someone else to help them with like you you mentioned having clients it sort of reminded me uh, now analogously of dieting you know it's it's uh it's easy to say you know what uh 1200 calories as a monday kind of thing and then by wednesday it's all gone to hell kind of thing i say this from personal experience by the way <laughs> yeah i'm uh, working that, with someone now to improve my health so i think that's a great analogy but uh, do you feel that way that uh, for most people who are cluttering and for whom it is having those uh, spiritual and, and mental and emotional effects that you mentioned, that uh, a kind of help from someone professional uh, is really uh, their best strategy? I would say so. Now, there are people that are really motivated. Like I've worked with a couple clients and we've had one session. They're like, okay, I've got what I need. I can continue on my own. And I think that's fantastic. But, you know, I'm getting uh, support with my health right now. I can't do my taxes. I would be in jail probably because I have no clue. I'm not a numbers person. So I hire someone to do that. So I look at that as the same way. You wouldn't, you know, if you're not yeah. an attorney, you would hire an attorney to do something legal I view it as the same way. And I think what's most important is having someone who is non-judgmental and supportive. Sometimes the issue is when people have their friends help, their friends are like, ah, let's just throw it all out, or they become judgmental, and that kind of sometimes makes it worse. Yeah, judgmental or making snide comments about, yes. you, you kept this all these years, that kind of thing. That's not yes. helpful, right? Yeah, it isn't. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much for this. As I say, it's a topic I'm super interested in. Uh, uh, and uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that if you're if you're having success with your clients, you really are changing their lives because uh, I know what it's like to be cluttered kind of thing. And uh, yeah, it's better not to be. And it's uh, it does have 
it's not it's more than just oh this toy is in my way and i have to step over it it has other effects so uh thanks for coming on the show and explaining it thank you and i just want to share with people if they go to my website reawakenyourbrilliance.com i have a free 10 ways that you might have clutter in your life and a take action item so if you're like oh, i'm overwhelmed with mental clutter bam i have a take action item in 10 areas so it's something that you can get started on today and for listeners all those uh, you can find the links uh for that that'll all be in the show notes as well so thanks again uh, julie and uh, good luck thank you